welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Appleton First Assembly of God. It's a privilege for me to be back with you this week and to continue to talk about how to win the battle within dealing with temptation. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about living in victory and that victory demands self-control. But before we get into that, I just want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings over tonight. Uh, over tonight's study, and I would encourage you, if you would, if you like to take notes, to get a, a pad and some uh, a pencil or a pen and get your Bible. And uh, I just really believe that tonight, um, if we'll absorb and understand that the Word of God can change our lives and use these studies and use these teachings as a tool a real practical tool to make applications in your life, I think you would be surprised at how much would start to change in your life if you would commit yourself to do them for an extended period of time. Not just a day, not just a week, but really make a commitment because you want to live in victory. And uh, so I'm excited tonight because I believe somebody, there's going to be a little spark, a light's going to come on, and you're going to be encouraged and, and, and understand that you don't have to live any more like you've been living if you're at that point of frustration and that point of discouragement and begin to really just question uh, so much about your life and your purpose and the direction and is this really all it's ever going to be. So I want to go to the Lord in prayer and I would encourage you to pray along with me. Pray for yourself. Pray that God would allow you through the Holy Spirit to glean from His Word exactly what you need. And I believe for the multitude that's watching tonight, I believe everybody may glean something different because the Holy Spirit, who's guiding you through the truth in God's Word, knows exactly what you need. And I believe the Holy Spirit has a, has a holy highlighter. And as I'm talking or reading the Scripture, if there's something you really need to see, maybe somebody else needs to focus on something else. I just think it's going to be so big and bright, and, uh, and you're going to be drawn to it. I, I really believe that, and I hope you do too. The Bible says that, you know, that, that we have to believe before we can receive. And so I want you to believe right now that you're going to get something that you can use, a tool to set yourself free tonight and to be able to live in victory, a victory that maybe you've never experienced, or maybe it's a victory you experienced before, but it's been some time since you've been walking in that right relationship with God. So uh, I've already sort of got into preaching, but uh, let me go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, I just thank you so much for tonight. Lord, your word, in your word it says that you sent your word forward and it healed them. And I believe tonight that as your word goes forth, that someone is going to be healed. Healed from depression, healed from discouragement, healed from frustration, healed from hopelessness. And I understand that healing is a process, God, but that process has to begin somewhere. And I pray that it begins tonight in the heart and in the mind and the life of someone that might be listening. So Lord, guide my, guide my thoughts. Let me just lean into you. And uh, as, as I follow you, Lord, you just help me lead the people that are watching to exactly what they need. And I just pray for your strength. And I just pray for a discerning ear on my part to make sure that I'm in tune with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. For several weeks now, we have been talking about this idea of how to win the battle within in dealing with temptation. And our guiding scripture comes from Galatians chapter 5, and I'll read that in just a minute. But last week when I was with you, we spent quite a bit of time talking about self-control. And I didn't get to finish that uh, full teaching on self-control as a tool and, and how to win the battle within and dealing with temptation. So I'm going to spend most of the time tonight talking about uh, victory demands self-control. And I hope that maybe as you're watching tonight that you are living in victory, which means you're winning the race that you're running with the Lord. But I do know this. I know that a lot of people aren't. And so before I get into the key passage that sort of was the underlying scripture for uh, this series of teachings. I downloaded the Passion Translation uh, t 
today at lunch, while I was at lunch on my phone, and I went to a passage of Scripture that's familiar to most, John 10 and 10. Uh, and, and I'll say this, Brother Russ has turned me on to the Passion Translation because it's bold, it's in your face, and uh, I just think the way that it interprets the Scripture is real relatable, but also applicable to, to each of our lives. So I want to read a Scripture. It's not on the screen tonight, but John 10.10, 10, and I want to read it out of the Passion Translation, if I can. It says, A thief, and remember who the thief is, he's that adversary, your enemy, the devil. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. Remember that. Anything that's not of God, the ultimate purpose of whatever is not of God that's in your life, whether it be people or circumstances or, or vices or, or activities or hobbies or, or what have you, anything that is not of God, it, it wants to just steal your life, slaughter and to destroy you. But it goes on to say, but I, speaking of the Good Shepherd, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, But I have come, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness, until you overflow. Man, that idea that, that, that Christ came to give us uh, and an abundance of blessings, more than we expect. And I do think our expectations are low. And I think they're low because of what our experiences in life has been thus far. And so a lot of times we adopt the idea that if we don't have high expectations, if we don't expect much, then we won't be disappointed. But I, I think it's important for us as, as believers in Christ to have great expectations and to know this, that God is going to rain down His blessings on our life as we do life with Him and we do it His way. You can't experience life in an abundance when we're doing life apart from God. So let me reread that last part again. It says, But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness, until you overflow. Are you at the point of overflow right now? Is your life that full, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness? And yes, self-control. Um, that's exciting because it's in God's Word because it's what it's the life that God wants us to have. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And I want to just go back, and I won't spend much time talking about Galatians 5, 16 and 17 tonight, but I do want to read it because I think it centers our thought and gets an idea of where we started this study several weeks ago. And, it's, and, and everything that we're going to talk about tonight still is in, in line in agreement with this scripture. It says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. For, for this will be the third week now, I have encouraged you at every point in your life, regardless if it's something that you might think is secular versus spiritual, at every point and in every aspect of your, of your life, whether it's your marriage, whether it's how you raise your children, whether it's what activities you do, in everything that you do in life, let the Holy Spirit guide you. And let me say this, He wants to do that. He wants to guide you. If you ever get to a place where you're not real sure, ask the Holy Spirit for His guidance. And one thing that He will do is He'll bring to your remembrance a scripture or some thought, something that you heard maybe in, a, in another sermon. And he'll bring that, that guiding thought into your mind, into your heart, and there's going to be that agreement. And, and, and so just ask him. Just be bold and say, God, I need you right now to guide me. I'm a little bit unsure of which direction. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go straight ahead? Just ask him. And when you ask, expect and believe. And if you expect and believe and ask in faith, then I do believe that you will receive. Because one thing I know, God does not want you like going around in your life like a sheep without a shepherd. He sent the Holy Spirit into our life after Christ returned to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit into our life to be that shepherd, that guiding force, that guiding light, so that we could experience that abundant life that, that, that God has for us. 
Verse 17 goes on to say, The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out... Okay, the last line of that scripture is, is kind of taken off of there, but, and I don't have it before me. But with what we got on the screen, let's just look at that. Your sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what your spirit wants. So there's a conflict that we've talked about that's going on inside of you, what your flesh wants, and then what your spirit wants to do, what God wants for you. And you have to make a choice. I would say daily, but it's more often than that. You have to make a choice many times throughout the day. What do I want? Do I want to cater to my flesh, or do I want to yield to the Holy Spirit and follow Him? Because if we follow Him, we're going to follow Him into an abundance, into a full life, and a full life that, the, that John 10 and 10 says that overflows. If you want that overflowing, blessed life with God, and I'm not talking about material possessions. I'm talking about a peace of mind. I'm talking about contentment. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about the aspects of life that really matter. Things that maybe others won't see on you, but they'll see in you as you express that uh, in, in, in your life. So, Let's look at Romans 6 and 12, and then we'll get into really t the new stuff, the new material for tonight's study. Romans 6 and 12 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. And last week, don't let sin reign in your body. Don't let sin reign. Don't let sin have control. Don't let sin be in control. So we have to exercise, in order for that not to be the case, we have to exercise self-control. And this is the definition that I shared with you last week. If you weren't watching, you can go back and watch last week's message or teaching. But I just wanted to review this concept of self-control and discipline. To be strong in a thing, temperate, tempered in our appetites, moderation, avoiding extremes, within reasonable limits, mild or calm, self-restraint in our actions and our speech. I want you to be strong in your ability to control yourself. Because the Bible says when we are much fruitful, John 15 says that when we are much fruitful, then God is glorified. When we are strong in the area of controlling ourselves and our appetites and our behavior and our speech and how we treat other people, when we're strong in that and we're able to flow in self-control and allow the Holy Spirit to really be in control of that aspect of our lives, God is glorified because you're different. You stand out. You're not like everybody else. You handle life differently. And in a world where everybody says they want to be their own person, can I tell you what happens with sin and when you give in to sin? Everybody just starts to look just alike. There's just layers of confusion and frustration and depression and disappointment and, and unfulfillment and this, this almost just wandering. Uh, there's an old Southern Gospel song, I think Hank Williams wrote it, but it was, Wandering so aimless, my life filled with sin. And I think there's so many people in the world uh, today that are just aimless. They don't really have a purpose. They may have a job. They may have a title. They may even have a career path. But in all of that, they don't have a purpose. And, and one thing, regardless of what you do in life, to know what your purpose is. That's one of the greatest blessings and gifts that you can ever achieve, encounter, or receive, to know what your purpose is. And we all have some, some purposes that overlap, but there is a specific purpose that you have, a specific purpose that I have, that maybe nobody else has. And so I want you to uh, discover your purpose and to walk in your purpose. And the only way that you can continue to do that is to walk in self-control. Tonight's title is Victory Demands Self-Control and Discipline. And look at that word victory. And I've got in my notes written down here, do you want to win? And is victory in your life worth it? 
Do you want to win? Or do you want to stay bound and limited in your life? And this idea of winning, what does that really mean? Well, think about the people right now who, who are bound by compromise, bound by apathy or indifference in their life. Uh, they, some people are bound to addiction. Some people are ba- bound to what other people think about them. Some people are bound to fitting in or, or peer pressure. And victory is winning those battles that, that if, if we don't win, we're going to limit ourselves. And so I love winning, and I hate losing. And I used, I've said this so often, and I don't know what people think when I say this. And, and although, you know, you have to be a good sport, you have to play fair, but I don't, I don't know that it's a good thing that you ever get to a place where losing doesn't bother you. So I want to win in life. I want to be the best that I can be. I may not be better than everybody else, and the older I get, I realize that I'm not as smart as I thought I was. I'm not as smart as, as a lot of people. I realize that maybe my talents aren't as uh, broad as maybe one time I thought they were, and that's okay. I may not be more talented than somebody, but I have to just uh, really um, focus on my purpose and do the very best that I can and be a person of excellence uh, and be a person of integrity And if I do that, then I'm going to win my race. Because you see, we're really not competing with different people in life. This idea of winning is making sure that we win the race that God has set for us. And most of the times in a race, there's a bunch of people running. But you know what? God has a path for us. And I think we need to focus on disciplining ourselves and and winning the life and achieving the goals and achieving the purpose that God has called for us. If we do that, Nobody may n- hardly ever know who we are. Our name may, 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 by, may not be known by anybody, but maybe our family. At the end of our life, we may not have a big crowd at our funeral service. But you know what? If we have achieved God's purpose for our life, then I want to let you know you've won. You may be a stay-at-home mom, and sometimes when you look at how the world judges success and winning, and you may feel like you're not doing that much. Listen, find your purpose. Understand what your purpose is and pursue it with all that you have. And let me tell you this, you'll win if you don't get distracted. You'll win if you stay the course. You'll win if you endure. You'll win if you don't quit. You'll win if you exercise discipline and self-control. And you will achieve victory in your life. The first passage of Scripture that I want to read is about running a race. It's found in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. It says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in a way that you may obtain it. Are you running your race to win? Are you just going through life? You just exist. You go from day to day, and you let life determine You let circumstances, you just wake up, and whatever happens, happens. And so, I want to be a person that runs to win. Verse 25 says, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And I want to just stop there before I finish verse 25. What that means is that they they are disciplined in their training. This is about someone who's going to run a race. So if you're preparing to run a race, you train and you train and you condition yourself. But it says, anyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They're disciplined in their training and they're disciplined in every aspect of their life. I think for some of us, if we're not careful, we do really good in certain areas of our life, but we have a certain area, part of our life, it could be finances, it could be health, it could be a relationship. I'm not sure. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about specifics. But we do good in about nine out of ten areas of our life, but there's that one that that, that we just leave unattended. There's that one that, well, nobody's perfect. Listen, I understand that nobody's perfect, and I understand that uh, it's a process of growing to that place of maturity. 
but is there an area in your life that you've just not been working on at all? It might be your health tonight. I can assure you as you grow older, your health will become more important to you. And if it doesn't, you will not be able to live in victory and then really fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. You have to make yourself and your health important because this is the only tool that God has really given us to serve Him with, our body. And so we need to really, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard messages on that your body's a temple. That doesn't mean we worship ourselves, but it does mean we need to take care of ourselves. And so uh, I want to, as I get older, you know, I'm fighting arthritis, I'm fighting a tendon problem, I recovered from COVID and I'm about 90%. So you've got all of these things that are going to happen. And if you're not taking care of yourself when these things happen, this, this is really going to be hard to recover. And I want you to walk in victory, and I want you to walk in your purpose. Um, it goes on to say, Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable perishable crown. Let me ask you this. Any sacrifice or any discipline or any self-control or any adjustments or changes you have to make in your life because you're really wanting to have a, that abundant life that God, that Jesus came for you to have, I really hope that you understand that in light of eternity and how short our earthly life is, any sacrifice that you have to make is well worth it. Because we're working for something that will last forever. Not only when we're dead and gone and maybe in the presence of the Lord, we're working for a legacy. We're working for a situation that our work is going to continue to be of service to others and minister to others long after we're gone. Can I tell you something? Your reputation and your character can assist people and help people and encourage people and, and be a servant to others long after we're gone. So just keep that in mind. Verse 26 says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight. Run your race with purpose. Find out who you are. Find out what God wants from you. Find out the, the, the exciting life that God has for you. And I didn't plan to talk about this tonight, but I do feel impressed just to make a few comments here. Do you find life with God exciting? If you're too religious, you probably say, well, I don't know. It's all about the thou shall nots. Listen, if, if you're focused on what you can't do and, and haven't walked into a place where you understand all the freedom and liberties that you do have, you're probably in a, in a deeper bondage than you even realize tonight. If you can't answer this question honestly tonight, is, is my life with God exciting? Do you enjoy those conversations that you have with God? Can you not wait till you get to talk to Him again and you have those special moments when His presence is so strong and real that there's, if there was any doubt in your life, those things just get erased and go to the sidelines. And, you know, to be honest, there's many times in my life where I get sucked almost back into a life of monotony and going through the motions. This life becomes mundane and just, you know, it's just like, that old um, Dunkin' Donuts commercial where the guy gets up every day at 2 o'clock to go to the bakery. It's time to make the donuts. It's time to make the donuts. Well, you know what? Life is more than that. And if you see your life as just a job and not a ministry, then it's hard to get exciting. But when you realize that whether you're a nurse or work at a hardware store or waiting on someone at Popeye's or McDonald's or you work at Walmart or Whatever your vocation is, whatever hobbies you have, if you go fishing at the river, if you go camping, uh, if you go to the beach, you go to the mountains, all of those things are ministry opportunities. And that's exciting. That I can, I can go to a baseball field and watch my grandson play baseball, and that's a ministry opportunity. First of all, it's an encouragement to him. Second of all, you never know who you're going to run into. You're never going to know who really needs a word from the Lord. And, and, and so just, just think about that life can be exciting if you view it in the framework that God has laid out for you. Think about this. Tomorrow morning, when you get up and go to work, instead of saying, oh, i got to go make, make eight hours, uh, I know a lot of times customers will come in while I work and they'll say, 
what's going on and or how are things going? And a lot of times I'll say, and and, and I shouldn't, but I do, I'll say, I'm just waiting on five o'clock. Just waiting on five o'clock. That's the wrong attitude to have. God's got so much for us if we'll just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and just look really look for any ministry opportunity that's available. And one of the best things that you can do is just be nice and courteous and smile and be considerate um, to others. All right. Verse 27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Let me say this. We have to discipline ourselves and all of the appetites that we have and bring them into control. Because this is really about, remember tonight's study, it's about victory. It's about having victory in areas of our life that to this point we failed to do so or at least failed to do so consistently. We've had some victory, but we backslide in that particular area and and, and, and God's not in control of that area. I think most of us probably have an area of our life where God is not in control, and that's the point of tonight's lesson, to get to a place where we may not be perfect, but we can honestly say that God's in control of every facet of our life. And uh, it says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. And I don't want that to happen to you, to get to a place where Regardless of the purpose that God intended for your life and the goals that He has for you and the life that He wants for you, we make decisions that limit God's ability to use us and we limit the opportunities to realize uh, that purpose that God has on us. I know that God can use us regardless of some of the decisions that we've made, but I do know this. I think about Samson right now, and uh, I preached a sermon one time on Samson, and I entitled it, Wasted Grace. All that God had in store for Samson, and he didn't control himself. He had a problem with lust and with women, and and it overcame him, and it robbed him, really, of, of the life that God wanted him to have. What God wants for you is not going to happen unless you get an agreement with God, and that requires discipline and self-control. The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? That's in Amos 3.3. And if God's wanting to go in in this direction, and you're not walking with Him, then you're never going to get to where God wants you to be. I've said this before. I have taken so many detours in life uh, that if life were an interstate, you know, I've gotten off at so many exits that, wor- that was not a part of God's plan for my life. I'm so many miles behind uh, getting to where God wants me to be. And, and honestly, there are sometimes you just can't make up some of that ground. But you can get closer and closer to the purpose that God has for you. And that's exciting. When you realize that, you know what, you not only have you discovered, but you're preparing yourself, you're conditioning yourself, and you're approaching and approaching and approaching and are fulfilling God's calling on your life. And that, I hope that's exciting to you. There is one passage in Scripture that talks about that we're to be salt of the earth and that when salt loses its flavor, it's still salt, but it has no usefulness. And you can still be a Christian, but based on not choosing to discipline your life. Love what it says here. But I discipline my body. Bring it into subjection. I control those appetites and those desires that I have that would take me away from the will of God, that will not enhance and help me achieve God's purpose for my life so that I might not become disqualified. I don't want to be salt that has lost its flavor and then become ultimately useless uh, in the kingdom of heaven. If you attend Appleton First Assembly and were at our last Sunday night's discipleship class, you'll find some of these scriptures that I'm going to use tonight that Brother Russ used as he's talking about the difference between a believer and a disciple. But some of the truths that are in those scriptures apply just to what we're talking about tonight, how to live in victory, and that victory requires self-control and requires discipline. 
I want to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There's a lot of things that you can do and not forfeit your faith, that you can do and still go to heaven. But I don't think that's the attitude that we should have. I can do it and still go to heaven. Let me ask you this. Can you do it and fulfill God's purpose on your life? Can you do it and fulfill God's purpose for you? Can you walk in victory and walk in peace? There's a lot of people that are so miserable and they are not experiencing the peace in John 14, 27 that Jesus said that he bequeathed to us. It was like his last will and testament. He says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives I give to you, that his peace cannot be taken away. The only way we're not at peace and walking in peace is we forfeit that through the decisions that we make, and then we spend so much time trying to recover something that we should have never let go of in the first place. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the gray areas and the questionable things, but just because you can does it mean that you should? Will your decisions, and let me say this, I think we need to set the bar higher than, can I still go to heaven if I do this? Can I tell you something? Jesus didn't die just so that you could go to heaven. Jesus died for you that your sins would be forgiven, that you could have an intimate relationship with God through him, and then he's got a purpose, and that purpose to bring glory to God. And you can't bring glory to God if you're living a loose life where, where the bar is set so low that all you want to do is just, 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 just make it into heaven by the skin of your teeth. Does that sound like somebody who really appreciates what Christ did for you at Calvary? This coming Sunday is Easter when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Good Friday celebrates his death. His, resur his death when he was persecuted and crucified. And, and man, he did all of that, not just so that we could just, you know, oh, I get to go to heaven. What a disservice to God's grace. What a disservice for what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross to not care about bringing God any more glory th than that. You know what that mindset is? That's a very selfish mindset. When you're thinking about yourself only, you're not thinking about how what you do affects others, and you're not thinking about how you behave uh, affects the reputation of God. Let me ask you this. Can you honestly say right now, if nothing else changes in your life, through your current decision-making process, are you bringing glory to God? Are you bringing a reproach on the kingdom? There's really not an in-between. If, if your life doesn't make somebody think about God, I think you're just wasting God's grace, and you're wasting those opportunities there. In the New Living Translation, that same verse says, You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Don't, don't allow something because you can get you to a place where you no longer can control your decisions about that subject or that, that particular thing. I need to move on. There's a lot of things in life that sometimes we're unsure of. And there's a passage in Romans 14 that has been so helpful for me. And that passage is, Whatever is not from faith is sin. If I can't confidently do it, because one aspect of the definition of faith is to have confidence in God. And if I can't with confidence, with confidence that it's right in God's eyes and that it will help me achieve the goal, purpose, and plan that God has for me, if I can't with confidence do that and knowing that it's going to enhance my walk with God, then the Bible says that's really sin. And let me say this. It may be sin for you, but it may not be sin for somebody else. And that may not make sense to you, but let me try and explain it quickly. Not everybody is called to the life that you're called to. Uh, by saying that, what I mean is, um, I'm called to preach, I'm called to teach. And so, 
there are some things that I probably can't do that some people might be able to do, and it, and it won't affect others in the same way. But I will, let me say this. I don't want to use the word louder, but the broader your reach is for God, the bigger impact you make for God, the uh, more people that you try and reach for God. And as your ministry expands, and we're all ministers, whether you realize it or not, you're going to have to think less about yourself and more about those that you're serving and ministering to. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'll use this scripture tonight, but there is a passage that Paul says, I am all things to all people that I might win some. I think I will get to that a little bit later. Uh, but anyway, what that means is we have to be aware. We don't live our lives as a slave to what other people think, but we're committed to serving God in ministry to others. And so that limits sometimes the choices that, that we have. And if we can't do it in confidence that this is going to help me be the person that God created me to be. I'm not anybody else but me. I can't be anybody else but me. So I need to embrace that and then pursue it. But if we can't do it with confidence in that sin, when I was a youth pastor, uh, I used this absurd example or analogy, but I think it drove home the point. I would tell my students, if you ask me if it's a sin to chew bubble gum, I'll tell you it is, even though I personally don't believe chewing bubble gum is a sin. I mean, that's stupid. But if you don't know and didn't have confidence in the truth of that, why would you even be asking me the question? You see what I'm saying? If you have to ask me, is it okay for me to do this? Then you're not confident that it's all right to do. And if you go ahead and do something before you get that issue settled, then you're committing sin, regardless of what it is regardless of how trivial it is. I need to cover some ground here. Do you want to live in victory? Do you want to live in victory? Do you want to live in that abundance and have that exciting life? And I did not plan to talk about having an exciting life until I sat down and started to, to do this teaching tonight. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in life that's just maybe not fun. Uh, but we got to get to a place where we see the bigger picture. We see beyond the moment. And so part of what we're going through right now may be just a, a time of preparation. It may be a time of um, uh, sometimes even isolation. There are times in the Bible where God would isolate someone so that they could prepare in a proper way and then go back stronger and then be released into their, into their ministry. But I want to go through a few passages of Scripture here in Galatians 6. And it really just, I want you to think about that everything you do, and I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I want you to understand that everything that we do has a consequence. Because everything that we do is a seed. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You will not reap something that you did not plant. So if you want a blessed life, can I tell you the best way to having a blessed life with God is living, living an obedient life and to live life with the, the right proper attitude, not just doing the right thing, but doing the right thing with the right attitude. If you're doing that, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a blessed life. You're going to have an abundant life. You're going to have a life to the overflow. But you've got to invest and sow into that. What do you want in life? That's what you invest. You can't, though, I just said a while ago that, you're, that you will reap what you sow and you will not reap what you didn't sow. Some of us reap something and we don't want to, excuse me, some of us sow something but we don't want to reap it. We want to sow bad seeds and just pray the harvest away. And I know I said something similar to this last week. Uh, God, in His mercy, sometimes will buffer the harvest. But God, as a good Father, a good, good Father, will not shield you from the consequences of your decisions and your actions. It would be not necessarily improper, but unfruitful 
for us to constantly get bailed out of jail, to be constantly do the wrong thing and not get any negative. This is a principle in the Word of God that is constant from Genesis to Revelation, the law of sowing and reaping. You will reap what you sow. For example, do you want to have friends in your life, a good collection of friends? I would encourage you to have a, just a small circle of, 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 of three, four, five intimate friends. Uh, any more than that, it gets way too complicated. But there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, to be a friend, you must show yourself friendly. You can't just always wonder why nobody wants to be around you or have anything to do with you or you don't get invited or included and you're always being left out and just walk around sulking and complaining and whining all the time because nobody likes me, nobody loves me, nobody cares. Uh, listen, if you want to be a friend, you've got to be a friendly person. You've got to be somebody that, that, that people want to be around. It's just that simple, and we try and make it so complicated. But it goes on to say in verse 8, For who sows to his flesh will of the fr flesh reap cor corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Are you sowing to the Spirit or are you sowing to your flesh? Is it what you want or is it what God wants? And you may say, well, I'm to the point in my life where what I want is what, God's, what God wants. Good. But can I tell you, if you don't live a disciplined life, that won't always be the case. One thing I've learned is you cannot bank, uh, you cannot bank things and store things up. You know, and when Jesus, when, when, excuse me, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and God began to feed them, every day he rained down fresh manna for them to eat. Fresh manna. That manna would only last for that day. There was only one day that you could get enough for two days, and that was because of the laws of the Sabbath, and I won't get into all that. But you couldn't go get a, you couldn't just get a bunch so that uh, you would have it to last the, the rest of the week. And sometimes, that's really how we live our life. We go to church on Sunday, and we have an encounter, some type of encounter with God, and we think that's going to be enough to get us through the rest of the week. That's really not the way that it happens. It's going to start your week off to a good start, but then Monday, you need some of that fresh manna. Tuesday, fresh manna. What is that fresh manna? A fresh word from God, a fresh fellowship, fresh communion, fresh prayer. you got to talk to God. you got to keep that relationship fresh. That's when it's exciting. Can I tell you, if you're not having an exciting relationship with God, you know what's not fresh? Your communion and fellowship and prayer life and your study of the Word of God. If you keep that fresh, your life's going to be exciting. It goes on and says, For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Well, what does that mean? That means that I can't do right for just a day or two days or three days and then throw my hands up in the air in despair when my my entire life doesn't turn around 180 degrees. You may be listening to me tonight and, and, and your finances are a mess. You've got credit card debt at the wazoo, so much that when you got that, your stimulus, I mean, it, that didn't help you out. You're so far in the hole financially. And you hear a message on tithing and how tithing can give you a financial breakthrough and you tithe for a week, you tithe for two weeks. And then the next month as your bills come back in and you just, you look at the situation and nothing's changed, you've got more come, you've got uh, more bills than you have income and you're just frustrated and you say, well, God, I, I've been tithing for two weeks. What about those 30 years you didn't tithe? What about those 10 years you didn't tithe? We need to think about those years that we didn't tithe. Those are bad seeds. Those are seeds of the flesh that we've sown. And so we're going to reap from that harvest for a season. And so you may have to do right a lot longer than you think in order to start getting some right results. But I do know God enough to know that He'll give you enough to see that it's worth it. And you know what? You shouldn't be doing what's right just to get a particular result. You should be doing what's right because that's what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do. And you want to walk in victory, which means you always want to do what's right. Not just for an intended result. 
If you're only doing what's right for an intended result, let me say this, your motive is not right because your motive is rooted in yourself and not the broader picture of what brings honor and glory to God. Romans 12 and 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil. Do you want to walk in victory? The way that we respond to some of the unfortunate things that happen in our life, some of the unfortunate things that happen to us, is not to respond in kind. The Bible says that the best way that we overcome some of the evil things and the wrong things that have happened to us is to overcome them by doing the right thing, by doing good. We can't get down on Satan's level. We've got to take the high road, and we've got to do it God's way. Even when sometimes for a, for a season, it may look like doing it God's way is causing you to still lose and to still suffer, and you're not gaining ground. But you've got to make an investment and sow that seed and nurture that seed and then be patient and the harvest will come and your life will change. Somebody needs to know that if they will, if they will pursue God long enough, their life will change. But in that pursuing God long enough, what's going to get lost is all the change that you wanted when you started pursuing God because as you mature and your relationship develops... What's, important, what's more important than your circumstance changing is maintaining that relationship with God. And that's when life gets exciting. Here's a passage in Romans 14. And, and, and I know I'm a little off base tonight with what I intended to be talking about. But it's about living in victory and how that demands self-control, that you just can't do what you want and have the life that God wants for you. Romans 14 and 16 and 17 says, Therefore, do not let your good be evil spoken of. You know what? You may be a good person. and You, may, there, I, you know, listen, a broke clock is right twice a day. You know, we've all got some good aspects of us. I think a lot of people are better than the worst thing that they've ever done. But that doesn't change the fact that sometimes if we don't live, and walk in the Spirit to the point that the Holy Spirit is in control and not us, and not our fleshly, carnal, sinful nature. No matter what we do and try and accomplish, it's going to be overshadowed by one mistake, two mistakes, three mistakes. Um, you think about people, and I'll throw out a few names, that did a lot of good. I'll throw out two pastors or two, two ministers. I don't know what your opinion of them is, and that's really not the point. But when you think about if I throw out Jimmy Swagger, uh, if you know who Jimmy Swagger is and followed him, uh, you'll know that he had uh, an adulterous uh, a, a relationship with a prostitute. Not once, but at least twice that's, that's on record. If you knew who Jim Baker was back in the mid-'80s, the, the PTL ministry and, and really the explosion of, of, of Christian TV evangelism. He was doing a lot of good and reaching a lot of people. But now sometimes when you think about Jim Baker, you think about the, the financial misconduct, his relationship with, uh, I think it was Jessica Hunt. I don't know, but I still remember, and sometimes those things taint a little bit, just one lapse in judgment, one bad decision. Uh, sometimes those things can really taint uh, all the good that you've been trying to do. And although you will have a field of ministry, I think sometimes our decisions just shrink the ministry field that we can have. And remember, we want to give God the most glory that we possibly can. So we want as big a ministry field that we can handle. We want as much of a ministry field that we can handle. And I don't ever want to get on a stage that's too big for me to handle. And the stage itself is almost too intoxicating that I get drawn into all of that and it becomes about me and it's no longer about him. And at the moment it becomes about you and not about him, oh my goodness, victory is almost out of reach. Do you hear that? The moment, in any moment, your life really, whether it's ministry or whatever, when it becomes about you, uh, victory and living in victory is almost out of reach. For the kingdom of God is not food or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what I think life is supposed to be. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
1 Thessalonians 5 and 22, if you want to abstain, excuse me, if you want to live in victory, it says abstain from every form of evil. Every form. Any way evil presents itself, you don't need to participate in it, you need to resist, you need to flee. Uh, I'll go on to read this passage here in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24. It says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let me just stop there. And this may sound a little redundant, but that's okay. I think some things have to... Rep if Jesus repeated himself and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, and he repeated himself over and over and over again... I think there's some reasons for that because sometimes we have a hard time absorbing what we don't want to absorb. Uh, and I do know this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I think more, the more you hear the Word of God, especially in the area where you're struggling, the more you hear it, the more you're going to start to believe it, and then you're going to start to do it, and then you're going to see your life begin to change. So let's look at this. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Again, your behavior, your life, your decisions, your choices, are they helping you achieve God's purpose? If they're not helping, they're a hindrance. I can get frustrated at work, and I do, regularly. But how I handle that frustration is very important. I've probably gotten uh, a little sideways with a customer before. Once or twice, no, probably more. I've probably gotten sideways with a coworker. A time or two. And so frustration is going to come, but how you handle the frustration is what's important. And, and when I don't handle it in the right way, is that helpful in the relationship that I have with that customer, in the relationship that I have with my coworker? And then the next time I come in on a Monday morning and I'm on a spiritual high because we had an awesome service and the spirit was moving and God spoke through Brother Russ and the worship was awesome and I just feel like I'm on cloud nine. <laughs> That employee that I was a little sideways with, he's not going to think much about my excitement. He's going to think about the experience he had when maybe I didn't choose to walk in self-control. And I know it seems like we're always on and we can't always be on, but you know what? If we allow the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he'll show us a way out of that tempting moment. And, and you know, there's one scripture that comes to mind that says a soft, a soft answer I think, turns away wrath. And I do know this. Sometimes our response to tense and unwelcomed circumstances uh, can decide how long that lasts, how long that season lasts, uh, or we can extend it, or we can sort of nip it in the bud and bring it to a conclusion. Is what you're doing in your life building you up? Is it building up the body of Christ? That's what the word edify means. I can do this, but is it building me up? I can do this, but is it building God up? I got to move on. Uh, verse 24 says, Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. It's not just about you. There are some people that God has placed in your life that I believe probably only you will be able to reach for the kingdom. And And... and Having said that, I know that sometimes if we fall short, God will put someone else in that place. But there's, there's something unique about you that will allow a rapport to develop between you and another person that I can't really connect with. And I believe most people, the best way to evangelize is through relationships where people see that you're real and they see the power of God in your life, and they see that it's not just a religion, but it's a real relationship that you have. And, and, and if we don't walk in self-control, we're not going to win people to the Lord. When we're constantly compromising, we're not going to walk in victory. This is the passage that I referred to, and I'm just going to read verse 19 and skip to the other verses because of time. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. I'm going to fast forward that, 
and just encourage you to go back and read that. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. There's a passage in James that I'll spend just a few minutes because uh, I'm running out of time tonight. It says, James 4, verses 6 through 8, it says, He gives more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I've highlighted what I think are the main points of this passage of Scripture here, and it says, He gives more grace. And in my study of the word grace, yes, most of you probably know the, the regular religious definition of grace. God's unmerited favor, which is true. But there's more to grace than just God's unmerited favor. It's where your gifting comes from. It's where your calling comes from. It's where we get the power to facilitate those callings and our purpose and so forth. So uh, I hope I'm not taking too much liberty with God's Word, but a lot of times now when I read the word grace in the Word of God, I substitute the word power. He gives more power because that's what His grace allows you to do. It's do you deserve the power that God's going to give you to overcome and to walk in victory? Probably not. But the thing is, because He loves you and because He's merciful, He's gracious to you and He gives you the very power that you need to walk in victory. That excites me, that God will give me the power. The power is there, the grace is there for me to walk in victory. And then it says he resists the proud. And that word resist means to exert force and opposition to oppose. Listen, the Bible says that God opposes those who are proud. Proud people have excessive self-esteem, they're haughty, they're arrogant, they're assertive, and they're controlling. If that's a little bit, if, if that hints at who you are, if there's a hint of that in you, you're going to find some of the frustration you're experiencing is because God is wanting to get your attention and saying, listen, if you don't modify your life and make some adjustments in your life, I'm going to work against you because I can't work through you. I will work against you until you get to a place of yielding and submission, and then I can start to work through you. Is that where you're at tonight? I want to encourage you, start yielding to the Lord so that you're not in constant opposition with the Lord. Sometimes we think we're fighting with the devil, and the reality is God's opposing us. God's the one who's trying to get our attention. It's not, you know, we, we blame Satan for so many things that God's doing because he's got to get us to a place of humility. Well, what does that mean? In Romans 12, 3, it says to be humble. It says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And if I can do anything and accomplish anything, it's because of the grace of God that He's given unto me. God should get any and all credit, and I should never take a, high, uh, a haughty attitude towards anybody. I used to, in a former life, so to speak, I was a, a, a math teacher. And there was a time when I was in college that, that, that I became very arrogant about the fact that I thought I was smarter because I could... Uh, uh, solve an equation and work algebra and do geometry and calculus and trigonometry and all of that stuff. But then I came to a place when I really began to see and understand what grace was. I could solve an equation and find out what X was because God gave me the grace to do it. And I shouldn't look at somebody who struggled in, even in general math or statistics or something like that and, and, and think that I'm better than because God gave me a grace to do something that they didn't have the grace for. And so, anyway, a humble person is someone who doesn't think more of themselves than they ought to. Anything, any achievement, anything that we do is because God's given us the grace to do it. Our response to that is obedience, and we do it His way, and we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and then we encounter that exciting life and that abundant life that He wants us to have. He gives grace to the humble. He gives power to those people who aren't so high-minded that they will allow God to use them. And they're not thinking about themselves so much that, that they're, not, they're ignoring others. Why would God give you something that he wants you to then use in, in, in service to someone else if you're never thinking about other people? Everything that God gives you, you use it for yourself and you just hang on to it. Wow. And then it says submit to God. Yield to the authority of God. 
I hear this all the time. I know what the Bible says, but. And that annoys me. That frustrates me. That angers me to a point. And it's okay to get angry. Just don't sin when you get angry. And don't stay angry too long. Because if you stay angry too long, you will sin. But it says, submit to God. And when we yield to Him, which means to follow the Holy Spirit where He wants to take us, it says, then you have the power, the grace to resist the devil. And it says, for a season, he'll flee from you. And in those moments, this is what we've got to do. In those moments when we're yielding to God and we're resisting and we're walking in victory, and the devil flees for us for a season, we need to draw near to him and allow him to draw near to us and really invest in that time. Because I can assure you, another temptation is coming. Another trial is coming. I don't want to scare you, but... It's exciting to know that whatever does come my way, I can walk in victory. That's exciting. I mean, I don't want to be someone and speak negative over my life and speak death into my life, but I came through COVID. Good. Some didn't. I don't necessarily understand and know why some did and some didn't. I really didn't think because of my age and general health, I'd have got as sick as I did. I don't understand all that, but one thing God did teach me and I shared this last week was what it was like to, to learn to live and to walk by faith. I've got to cover some ground. Then it goes on in that passage that we covered. It says, cleanse your hands, your actions, your behavior. One translation says, quit dabbling in sin. We haven't just jumped into it, you know, uh, just all just allowed it to overtake us. But we're dabbling, we're dabbling. Purify your hands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. It means to check your motives and make sure that your inner life is okay. Your outer life is important. You know, what's going on on the outside, that's important. But what's really important is that inner life. The Bible says to be renewed in our inner man on a daily basis. And we need to think about that. Then it says... You double-minded. And that is defined as a heart that is divided between the God and the world. And we have a divided loyalty. I don't have the time, but I'm just going to go through these. And how can I walk in victory on a consistent basis? One, commit yourselves to God daily. Romans 12, 1 says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable for God to expect you to commit your life to Him. But do it on a daily basis. Confess your sins daily. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every day we need to just talk to God about uh, our sins. And sometimes I ask God, Is there something that I've done wrong that maybe I don't see? Maybe I don't understand that the full... Uh, breadth or the depth of something that I've done. Confess those sin sins to the Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in that area. And this is a part of Psalms 51, 10 through 12. is a section of scriptures where David was confronted by the prophet and then he's, try he's in the process of talking to God and this is a prayer of repentance. And I want to just read a few verses out of David's prayer of rep repentance after he had... Um, had an affair and had Uriah killed. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. For over a year, between the time that David sinned and he repented, one thing that he noticed that was missing in his life was the joy of having a relationship with God. And that's what sin does. It puts distance between you and the Lord. doesn't mean the relationship is not there, but it does mean there, there's distance and there's not joy because the Scripture says the joy, it says in His presence is the fullness of joy. In His presence is the fullness of joy. If you're not dealing with sin, you're going to start to put distance between you and God. You're not going to come into His presence on a regular basis. You don't feel comfortable. You feel awkward. And so we've got to just be bold enough to deal with our sin so that we can come again into His presence 
and his presence is fullness of joy. And Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we need to regain our strength, and we do it through regaining our joy. Uh, subject your minds to his control. Uh, Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you may prove what is that good and acceptable um, and perfect will of God for your life. Let your mind be renewed. Uh, there's a passage in Ephesians 4 that talks about taking off the old man and putting on the new man, which is kind of what we're trying to do on a daily basis, that conflict between the two. And in between, in, in, in Ephesians 4, 24 and 23, it talks about being renewed in our mind. The only way we're going to transition from that old nature to that new nature is to make sure that our mind is kept right so that we're not conforming to the world. Proverbs 23, 7 says, A man thinks in his heart, so he is, or so he becomes. And so we've got to be very careful about our mind and our thought life. And if you don't control your mind and your thoughts, you will not walk in victory. Because every sin begins with a thought. Every dishonest deed begins with a thought. Every word that's hurtful and harmful begins with a thought. So if we can control our thoughts, we're going to be able to walk in victory. Have a disciplined prayer life. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, study the word of God. Uh, Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner and of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you want to find out who you really are, not who you profess to be, but if you want to find out who you really are and if you're really walking in victory and if you're really walking in God's will, purpose, and plan for your life, study the Word of God. Spend some time in God's Word and you're gonna, you will find yourself the true you in God's Word. And I want to my prayer for you is that when, when you find yourself, there won't be shame, but there will be excitement because you see the progress and you see the victory and you see the growth and you see the maturity and you see how faithfulness to God, faithfulness to God will produce a harvest that is just almost mind-boggling. Associate with the right kind of people, Put on the whole armor of God. Depend on the Spirit of God. And I don't want to slight, I don't want to slight those points, but I am out of time tonight. And the next time I'm with you, I'm not sure if I will continue in this and this. But um, go back and you can pause the video and you can look at these scriptures and you can go back and cover that. But I think tonight I've said enough. And 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 I believe with my whole heart that if we seek God, I love what Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, if we seek and search for God with all of our heart, we will find Him. And in finding Him, we will find us, and we will find our purpose. And there's no greater joy than to know why we're here. I shared it with you last week. I've shared it with you already tonight. Ultimately, it's to bring honor and glory to Him. It's not just about us. Our life is about others and how we represent God to them, and that God allows us to be his representative to the world. And he's given to us the ministry, the word says, of reconciliation, that through us, imperfect people, others can be reconciled and brought into relationship with Christ. That's exciting to know that God might use me to see someone saved. That's exciting. And so I want to just encourage you tonight, if you want to walk in victory and see your life change, it only happens through self-control. You've got to run your race with purpose and passion and run it his way. There's a lot of things that you've been holding on to you just got to let go of. It's just not worth it. The cost is too high. The cost is too high. The risks are too high. The reward is in following God in complete and total swift obedience. Listen, I want to pray for you tonight and I want to encourage you and the, understand this, the life that God has for you is a life that can be lived out. God's not given us a goal 
and making it impossible to get there. If we humble ourselves, if we don't think too much of ourselves, then we should. The Bible says he will give us the power and the grace, the power and the grace. And then we can yield to the Lord, we can resist the devil, we can draw close to him. And in that intimate fellowship with God, man, that's just an awesome, sweet place to live and to be. And that can be your reality tonight. Father, thank you so much for tonight. I just pray that, that your word is beginning to really uh, bring a harvest in the life of these people. It's affecting their thought life. It's affecting their decisions and their choices. And in doing so, Lord, they're sowing new seed. They're sowing good seed. They're sowing your seed. And when they sow your seed, they're going to get your harvest. But God, if they continue to sow their seed, they're going to get their harvest. And probably it's what's bringing the frustration that they're dealing with right now. God, I love you, and I thank you for the privilege to teach your word. And let me, in doing so, in my own life, not conduct myself in such a way that I would be disqualified from being able to do this again. Lord, I just ask that your hand be on each and every person that's listening and watching tonight. Bless them, Lord. Guide them. Lead them. I know you're going to show them the way. And I just pray for courage and boldness and every person that's listening out, that they're going to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, this coming, up East, this coming up Sunday is Easter Sunday. I just, man, I would love for you to be in worship with us. We have worship services coming Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. And we would just love to see you here. We have a nursery. We have children's church, kingdom kids. We have all of that this coming Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I want to see you here at Appleton First Assembly of God. God bless you and have a good night.